Salim, I think it was Confucius who said, life is simple, we just make it complicated. And the <laughs> impeachment vote in the House of uh, Representatives in the United States the other day is certainly one of those instances surrounding which there's so much complexity, uh, which I think is unnecessary. And I want your opinion today on the impeachment and what it means for America, what it means for Canada, some of the broader picture. But to put that into context, I just want to um, go through just a couple of points in this complex issue that in my investigation, my reading, have come out to be the salient points, the points that are of most importance to me in trying to understand this impeachment process. And that is that, first of all, there was a wealthy billionaire in the Ukraine by the name of Mykola Slokevsky, who created a, a company dealing in gas called Burisma. Now, Zalevsky, ironically, was also a minister for the ecology. Now, people can let that sink in for a bit. Just imagine if a CEO from one of the oil sands firms was our minister of the environment, how that would go down. However, that's a little bit of an aside because the allegation is that, um, not against Trump, but the allegation is that Burisma founder Mikolov Zalevsky, Zlokevsky, sorry, hired Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, having no experience in the gas industry whatsoever, in order to use Hunter's influence on his father, Joe Biden, at the time Vice President of the United States under Obama, to have a prosecutor fired, a Ukrainian prosecutor who happened to be investigating corruption and money laundering, and Burisma was on uh, of a list of companies that they were investigating. And, and, and to use Joe Biden's words, well, the son of a bitch got fired. So later on at Council for Foreign Relations video, Joe Biden bragged about the fact that he had the prosecutor fired, although he did not bring up his son, of course. Jump forward to July 25th of this year, and we have the president of the United States now, Donald Trump, calling up the new president of the Ukraine, Zelensky, and the conversation became the point of, through a what they're calling a whistleblower, but is actually an accuser, grounds for impeaching the president. And I have the transcript here, which is basically the only document of any hard substantial evidence for impeachment that was presented to the, uh, the House, the rest being all innuendo and hearsay. So if we look through the transcript, and I'll be very brief here, there are two points that jump out. At one point in the conversation, he says, the president says to Zelensky, Zelensky, I would like you to do us a favor. I'd like you to find out what happened to this whole situation with Ukraine. Uh, they say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, and then it becomes inaudible. Um, of the server he mentions. They say Ukraine has it. So in other words, this was about crowd strike. This favor was about finding out about crowd strike and crowd strike, of course, was a company who helped investigate the leaking of the emails from the Democratic National Committee. Later on in the transcript, he talks about a completely different thing. So no, no favors are mentioned, but he talks about the other thing, and I'm quoting here, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the Attorney General, and he's talking here, I think, about the American Attorney General, would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. That's it. That's the entire evidence that the House has, in my estimation, my reading of it, if we tear away all the dross, tear away all the, the complexities that are superficially imposed on this issue, that people have to look at. A transcript that 
is perfectly innocent in my estimation. No quid pro quo, no if you don't do this then I will do that, unlike with Joe Biden, if you don't fire the prosecutor I won't loan you a billion dollars. So Celine, with that background, and there's a ton more we can go into, however, <laughs> for brevity's sake, with that background, what does this impeachment, and you can talk about the vote, what does the uh, vote on the impeachment, because he hasn't been impeached yet in my thoughts, um, mean for the Democratic Party, the 2020 election, America as a whole, and from Canada's perspective, looking down at this fiasco, what does it mean to you? Give us your expert opinion. <laughs> it means a lot. I mean, books will be written, I mean, uh, 100, 150, 200 years from now, people will be looking back on this whole episode uh, of this vote that happened on Wednesday evening and whether that vote is in any way uh, to be taken as a fact that the President of the United States, the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, has been impeached by the House. Uh, it is uh, the responsibility of the Constitution gives the House the responsibility to impeach a sitting president. And then the articles of impeachment goes to the Senate and it is in the Senate that the trial takes place. So the question that you have raised, whether <laughs> Uh, the president has been impeached or not because now it is what we're we we talking three days after four days after uh, the vote that took place which all of us saw those of us who are interested in watching all of these things happen saw the vote take place um and that has gone into the record and um whether that is as a matter of fact an impeachment has happened or it is all a fairy tale because nancy pelosi the speaker of the house has as so far not send the articles of impeachment to the Senate, you know. And so we are, in that sense, in a totally uncharted territory. But getting back to the story that you have told, uh, and, and very well, and, and we can go deep into it, but I am reluctant because I think we will put everybody to sleep on this matter, yes. uh, is, is a story that has no leg when it comes to uh, charging the president according to the constitution i mean the constitution is very clear about uh, it's a it's a very short sentence you know uh, and it's very clear here i have the constitution by the way um robert just to give you a background this this copy of the constitution i picked up for 10 cents us <laughs> 10 cents us in 1976 on the bicentennial year in philadelphia I visited uh -huh. Philadelphia for the bicentennial celebration, you know. I've gone back to Philadelphia a number of times. After that, I took my daughter and my son, you know, to, to do the historical walk and so on. So for the Liberty Bell. But this is very this is, this is a very, you know, memorable copy of the Constitution that I hold. And it's a very small document, as you can see, which is the most remarkable thing about the American Constitution. It is easily accessible, readable, very short and precise. And so in Article 2, which is the article that deals with the chief executive uh, of the United States and his responsibilities and how he's to conduct himself as the chief executive, that is the president of the United States, Section 4 of the Article 2 has just this following sentence, you know, or rather the phrase, the president shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of, so they have impeached in, in the sense that, you know, that is a matter of dispute, but I will leave it for the moment. They have impeached the president and the conviction has to take place in the Senate. Uh, that means the trial and the decision. Uh, for what? Treason, bribery, or the high crimes and misdemeanor. So you have told the story about what happened in this particular issue, which is what they have rigged it up to charge the president for high crimes and misdemeanor. It all began whether there was a quid pro quo, then it was whether there was a bribery, and then, you know, it's a question of high crimes and misdemeanor. Uh, and none of that stands, you know, when, when one goes into the nitty gritty detail. The president, that is Donald J. Trump, called the president of the Ukraine, as you have 
mentioned and you ran through the script, uh, call the president, first of all, to greet him uh, uh, on becoming the president of Ukraine. And then in that conversation mentioned, as you've talked about it, he asked the pre president uh, Zelensky to investigate, uh, uh, to do us, as he says, to do us, that is the United States, not him in person, to do us a favor, that is to see what this cow strike is all about, uh, that, that had caused so much problem in the US in the 2016 election. And then, by the way, he said about, uh, you read the transcript about uh, Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden. <coughs> and um, the Democrats seized upon that conversation of July 25th to blow it up into that the president had engaged in quid pro quo to interfere once again to get the Ukrainian, uh, a foreign government, to interfere with a domestic issue in America, which is the election, uh, to investigate uh, Joe Biden and his son for uh, Hunter Biden being given a position at $80,000 a month uh, with Burisma, an oil and gas company, a Ukrainian oil and gas company, in which Hunter Biden had no background. He has no background in gas or, or oil business. And so this was a pay for play scheme. And uh, the president asked for investigation because Ukraine is one of the most corrupt, corrupt governments in the face of this earth. And there's all sorts of um, issues surrounding what is happening with the American aid money going into the Ukraine and the, and the scheme of kickback. So that's, that's what it is. We can go into the gritty detail, but I would want to put it into context. Why did this July 25th call became the trigger for the Democrats to go into such a half that the president is a clear and present, uh, what, what did they call him? Clear and present danger. He has to be immediately removed. That means impeached and removed because he will otherwise continue to tamper with the help of foreign government, the due electoral process in American politics, you know, that he, he he's a person who cannot be trusted, who is a traitor, who, uh, who is a stooge and a puppet of uh, first in, in, in instance Vladimir Putin of, of, this, of Russia and now of President Zelensky, to whom he's asked for a favor, personal favor, that's the quid pro quo business, and a bribery. The bribery is that, you know, if you do us this favor, we will then release uh, the foreign aid money to Ukraine that has been passed by the, the Congress. Uh, so why was this all ginned up, rigged up? And that's the interesting story, uh, Robert. You see, um, <clears throat> a couple of months before the July 25th call, the much anticipated Mueller, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, to investigate the Russia collusion came down with the report after 22 months of investigation, after spending millions of dollars, I believe over $35 million, 40 lawyers uh, that was in the team of the special counsel, Robert Mueller, over 2,800 subpoenas, uh, 500 uh, witnesses and so on and so forth. They came out with nothing. It was a big, Thud. Now, the Democratic Party, the deep state, had invested all of their energy and all of their expectation that Robert Mueller will find the, 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 the goods on President Trump, that he will find uh, that, that allegation that had been ginned up. Uh, by uh, the FBI, by the CIA, by by the uh, director of the in national intelligence, as all high intelligence officials of the Obama administration, uh, based upon a document that that people came to know very soon, that was a fake document, bought and paid for by the Hillary campaign, that is the Christopher Steele dossier that accused and alleged. Uh, 
the relationship, some of them most salacious uh, conduct on the part of President Trump and the relationship between uh, the Russian Federation with Vladimir Putin uh, and, and President Trump, all beginning with the accusation that the Russians had uh, basically hacked uh, the homebrew server of Hillary Clinton when she was the Secretary of State, something like 33,000 emails, and that they were passing on those inf information to President Trump. So here it is, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the effort to get uh, 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 an, uh, the president impeached has been the entire priority of the Democratic Party, of Hillary, of the deep state uh, that now we know. We would not have known any of these things if Hillary had been elected. All of this yes, would have right. gone under the un, un, under the bridge. And now we know that the Obama administration uh, had weaponized the intelligence community, that is the 17 intelligence uh, 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 agencies of the American uh, state, uh, most importantly, the CIA, the FBI, the DNI, the Defense Department intelligence, and so on and so forth. They've weaponized it to <clears throat> gather information, to surveil uh, the Trump campaign, to monitor and wiretap them. And um, they, of course, denied all of this thing. And now we know that. And how do we know that? Well, first of all, there was those hearings that took place in 2017 in the Congress. And the Democrats kept saying that these are all fake. There's nothing to it. Uh, and then in the 2018 election, the Democrats took the House back. And so now they have the control of the various committees, the Intelligence Committee, the Judiciary, and so on. And they ratcheted up their effort to find the reason to indict the president. They had the Mueller uh, special counsel working away full time. And uh, the, the thing that people began to suspect, or enough people began to suspect in America of what had happened with the Obama administration, all came together when on December the 9th, just a few weeks ago, the Office of the Inspector General for the FBI, Michael Horowitz, the director, uh, or, or rather the Inspector General himself, released the final report on the FBI and pointed out all the malfeasance, all the corruption, all the irregularities, all the impropriety that James Scopey, the FBI director, had used the steel dossier and his people in the FBI leadership, the deputy director, the lawyers, mm -hmm. Peter Strobe, Lisa Page, Andrew McCabe, they had used the steel dossier to get the FISA code to give the warrant to surveil and spy upon Trump campaign yes. member team in fact, they were very low members, Carter Page and George Papadopoulos. And, and they were doing that to use them to enter into the Trump campaign. And now we know all of this thing. It's so true. There is it's true, Celine, because um, I think what we're getting into, though, is the unnecessary complexity of this issue. And I, but I think that you've, you've hit upon the, the one simple explanation is that the Democrats from day one, January 20th of 2017, have told the American public they will impeach this president. So all they did was had to wait until they got the lower house back two years later, and then they just had to find anything that they could label a high crime or a misdemeanor. If, if Trump had uh, jaywalked on Pennsylvania Avenue and got a ticket, they would have labeled that a misdemeanor or a high crime enough to vote to impeach. And so all of the backstory with Mueller and the FBI and the Steele dossier, you're right, that was a nothing burger. That failed. That was just keeping time until they could find something. And then all of a sudden he calls 
and mentions Joe Biden, a rival politically uh, for the presidency in 2020, um, to investigate his son, or not to investigate his son, but to investigate the matter. And so whether it was jaywalking or whether it was this innocent phone call to Zelensky, you've, you've outlined the pattern that this was in the works since day one. And it yes. doesn't matter what happened. Yes, Robert. That's, I mean, the time I've taken to do that is just to establish the fact that the Democrats were out to nullify this vote of 63 million Americans to elect Donald J. Trump as their president. Now, that is the high crime and misdemeanor. Mm. So everything that the Democrats have thrown at President Trump is, ironically, a projection of what they have been doing. They have done the surveillance, the yes. illegal surveillance. They have used the FISA code to spy upon American citizen that is prohibited. They have used the FBI in a corrupt manner, that is the FBI director, James Comey, in a corrupt and improper manner to interfere in a domestic political campaign. You know, in fact, the list of impropriety, irregularity and unlawful behavior is too long for you and me to go through it. I just wanted to establish that. Oh, yes. I want to also what it is, is uh, Salim, what it is, as you correctly point out, is a distraction. It is a diversion so that people look at Trump rather yes. than look at the actual money laundering of Burisma, yes. uh, where yes. the federal aid from the Obama administration to the Ukraine went. And we're talking yes. seven and a half billion dollars, 80 percent of which was American funds, according to uh, Rudolf Giuliani. Um, yes. We're looking at the fact that why did Burisma hire Hunter Biden when he has no experience? What else could he have been hired for other than the fact that he was the vice president's son? So you're right. The first thing is that it's been planned from the beginning. The second thing is that it's a cover up. It's a diversion. What else can we take away from this impeachment fiasco? But, uh Right, but I'm, I'm, I'll get into it. I mean, the 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 the, the story, the, or rather, what is the what is the implication? I mean, that's what we want to, in in a sense, talk about. But I I just want to fill out some further facts. You know, um, the Burisma story that you have narrated is what they are using to indict the president and then to impeach him, and which is what they, the vote was on Wednesday, was about the pay to play scheme by Joe Biden and you know that you know we will release the money he he in fact said, sat as you as you pointed out and we have all seen those clips from the Council of Foreign Relations video uh, at the conference where he sat down and boasted he looked at his watch and he said you know you got one hour or something like that six hours yes. and you better fire that man otherwise the thing will not be released the money will not be released and that's the pay for play scheme <clears throat> so in the collusion was Joe Biden with the with the Ukrainians, you know, and a kickback taking place. Now, the bigger collusion story was the Russian collusion story. And who was colluding? It was Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. It was Hillary Clinton who had gone to Russia, said she's going to reset the button for the relationship. It was Hillary Clinton who had sold, signed off the Uranium One deal. Mm -hmm that sold 20% of the uranium uh, uh, resources, a supply of this uranium one to the Russians. The Russian paid money, uh, something like a half a million dollar for a 35 minute speech by Bill Clinton in Moscow. So, you know, as I said a little while ago, everything that the Democrats have said that President Trump is guilty of is actually a, a projection of what the Democrats have been doing. And I think that needs to be established. The other thing is that the President Trump had run, that is as, as candidate 
the Republican nominee in 2016 election, he had run, and he's been talking about that ever since, that he is committed to draining the swamp. Here is the issue then. What is the swamp? That is the DC swamp, the capital swamp. That is the permanent bureaucracy in Washington, of which the intelligence agencies is one of the permanent bureaucracy. Then the setup in the Congress, the House and the Senate, uh, uh, and, and their activity, how corrupt they are, what has happened to the American people, you know, what has happened to the American economy, of how these people, the, the swamp, has maneuvered for the last half a century, and more precisely, for the last 25 years since the end of the Cold War, to enrich themselves and to, in a sense, impoverish the American people. So here is a man who came with an openly stated goal and objective that he will drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. He will clean out the mess, you know. And so, from the moment he walked into the White House after the inauguration, or from the moment that he won the election on the night of November the 8th, 2016, the swamp has been busy to decapitate the president politically. And, and that's the story that we need to understand. And we need to understand that story because the corporate media has twisted the fact completely around. The American media, the mainstream media, has been used by the Democratic Party through leaks after leaks, that is the swamp has leaked the story, to brand the president as the culprit, as the traitor, as the guy who won a fraudulent election as an instrument and tool of a foreign power, in this case, Vladimir Putin. And this has been done by the corporate media, the, both the television and the uh, electronic press. <clears throat> so New York Times and Washington Post, uh, NBC, CBC, CNN, they have run a 24 by 7 campaign against Donald J. Trump right from the outset. Now, it is not only the corporate media in the United States, we are now talking about global also. The same thing in Canada. The issue that I think we need to, uh, in a sense, emphatically state, that apart from the few people who have followed the story in detail, and have followed the story and the backstory, and have understood what is at play, the vast majority of the people, both in the United States, but definitely in Canada, is being very badly served by the media. Yes. And I would say deliberately badly served by the media. You go around and talk to the Canadians, they have no idea of what has happened in the United States. And they're all basically, especially in our universities and our colleges, by our elite establishment, that President Trump is a vulgar man, is a, is a man who cannot be trusted, is a man, you know, uh, who has just used the words, you know, who has sold out American interests to, in this case, Russia, or to the Ukrainians, and so on and so forth. It has been basically the corporate media story that has been told, you know, where the actual facts is just the reverse. This is the precedent that in the last three years, this is the third, we just had the third anniversary of the election, so we are now in the fourth year of his first term, um, that has completely turned around the American economy, as he said he would do. This is a soaring American economy. The employment is a full employment. Jobs have been created. In November, the report that came down was he had created something like 270,000 jobs. In his three-year term in office, over 7 million jobs have been created. Investment is flowing back. You know, industries are coming back to America. The economy is booming. The wages are high. The, the minority, the blacks and the Hispanic, they're having a record-breaking employment taking place. What happened in Canada? The same November that the American report came out that the $270,000 they had been created in one month, our report was reported in the United States that we had lost something like 70,000 jobs. And that had been kept under cover during the October election so that nobody would know. 
<clears throat> so the corporate media is no longer the fourth estate for the people holding the people in power accountable. In fact, it has become the instrument of the establishment. And in the United States, the question is whether the corporate media is now the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party is the instrument of the corporate media or the reverse. But whichever way it is, whether the Democratic Party is using the corporate media for its purpose or the corporate media is using the Democratic Party for its purpose, this is the billionaires in America, the corporate media which is running a campaign against the people of America. Yes. And that's the story that needs to be understood. And this is where we come down to. I mean, if we, if we want to put it in a, in a larger context, in a context in which this is not simply about America, it is of the struggle of the 21st century. Robert, this is where, where we are. Globalism. The Democrat Party is a globalist party. It is being run by the corporate media. The corporate media is a mouthpiece of the Democratic Party, and they are globalists. President Trump is the first president in American history, and especially the first president since the end of Second World War, who is actually a counter-revolutionary. He puts the interests of the nation state, make America great again. That is to bring back, to make America stand again. You know, American exceptionalism, American state, the defense of the nation state. <clears throat> That's what the 2016 election was all about in America. That was the 2016 referendum in Britain all about, the Brexit, you know. We in Canada, are the only Anglo in the Anglo-American sphere, that is the English-speaking country, out of step. The Australians have elected a conservative government, the Liberal Party in Australia. Now, you know, uh, in December, uh, a couple of weeks ago in Britain, uh, it was a resounding victory uh, of Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party committed to Brexit, that is a nail in the coffin of the globalists uh, in the world. The 2016 election in America was make America great again, you know. So, Robert, I mean, uh, to, to put in the larger, bigger context of uh, the story of what has happened in America with Donald Trump is to understand uh, that this uh, effort to nullify his election is part of the globalist agenda of the deep state in the, in, in the United States, the Democratic Party, uh, and, and that has been, in a sense, the effort of the globalists to prevent a, a, a nationalist, populist government uh, in uh, countries like Canada, Australia, and of course Britain uh, take power. We have seen in, 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 in Britain, uh, uh, in the election about 10 days ago, uh, Boris Johnson coming back with a resounding victory. Uh, and so the Brexit deal will be done. In Australia, uh, they elected earlier on uh, a conservative government, the Liberal Party of Australia. So Canada is the only country with our October election that has been not only bucking the trend uh, of the uh, rise of populist nationalist government against the globalist agenda, it seems that we uh, have gone on the other direction. We have actually gone along to elect a party and now a government that is fully committed to the globalist agenda yes. with, with the UN, UN uh, Paris Accord, UN Global Migration, uh, Compact on Migration, UN Agenda 2030, and so on and so forth. So that that is the larger story. And you can see that the Canadian media is as complicit in that sense, the corporate media, in telling a story or spinning a narrative that basically smears uh, the, the nationalist populist leader like Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, you know, in the case of Canada, it was Maxime Bernier who was basically smeared and destroyed in a, in a sense of a new party. He didn't have the depth of the support and the background. And it was very easy given the nature of our electorate and our society at this stage of our history to destroy a person. And that's what the corporate media did. Yes. So this uh, 
is a, is a good way perhaps to end it uh, with the context of, <laughs> it almost sounds conspiratorial, doesn't it? But it, the fact, in fact, it is conspiratorial. What, does, what, is a cons what is a conspiracy? Is two or more people getting together to do something? It doesn't have to be hidden. It's an open conspiracy with all the globalists in the world, from George Soros, who has said that he hates the United States, who says that he wants an open society, you know, to Justin Trudeau, who says that the United Nations is, a, is, the, is the way to go and Canada is the first post-national state, to Merkel, to Macron, all of these globalists out there have openly said what they want. And the vote to impeach President Trump, arguably the best president the United States has seen, at least in my living memory, um, just goes to show the extent to which these globalists will, will go to, to destroy the United States, to destroy anybody who gets in their way. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, there are times when, you know, conspiracy is simply a way to fabricate a story to undermine and delegitimize uh, whoever is the target. Uh, but there are times when conspiracy happens. I mean, yes. uh, whether it's the conspiracy uh, that took out um, President Lincoln, or was there a conspiracy that took out President Kennedy? Uh, people are going to still be arguing. They have been arguing ever since those in events happened. Um, a conspiracy now, which has been more or less exposed by uh, the Inspector General, even though Inspector General says that you know he didn't find any testimonial or written evidence of bias. But the fact of the matter is that the record that goes to show uh, the improper illegalities and so on and so forth that happened uh, with the FBI and the CIA and now that those investigations are going will, in a sense, once the indictment takes place, once the grand jury is voted and the indictment takes place and the matter goes to the court, which is what many people expect, uh, then, yeah, there was a conspiracy. I mean, th these people fabricated a story ran with that story. The corporate media participated in uh, broadcasting that story. Uh, and the politician uh, felt vindicated that what was imagined, you know, the little boy that cried wolf. And the wolf was there in their imagination. And uh, that they went, they went on to operate on that or to act upon that narrative, that story that they themselves had created with the vote that took place for all of us to witness. Now, whether that has been an impeachment done in the legal sense of the term or, or not is a matter that, that will be disputed or uh, until we know, you know what happens. If, if Nancy Pelosi doesn't bring those articles of impeachment into the Senate, we will see what the next step will be when the Congress returns in January. Uh, but all of that goes to show how deep, how concentrated, and how focused was the effort of the Democratic Party and the deep state to nullify the vote of 63 million Americans who voted for Donald J. Trump to be the 45th president of the United States. And that effort continues, you know, and, and unless in the 2020 election, uh, President Trump is not only reelected, and I would predict that he, I'll go on to predict, not I would, but I'll go on to predict that he is going to be reelected. And he might be reelected very well on a landslide election. You know, it might be of a historic proportion reaching the similar uh, manner in which President Nixon won the election in 1972 against George McGovern when the Democratic Party nominated one of the most uh, left oriented uh, senator as the Democratic nominee. Then uh, in 1984, when um, Ronald Reagan won his re-election against Walter Mondale, that was a landslide election of a historic proportion, 49 uh, to 1 in the Electoral College. That is 49 states for Ronald Reagan, one state for Walter Mondale, that was his home state, 
you I bring mean, up something so you bring up something Celine that I think is also um, <clears throat> germane to this discussion and that is that people look at the votes that Trump got but he got less votes than Hillary Clinton and they're saying that sure we're going to be dismissing the votes of 49 percent or almost 50 percent of the United States but Hillary got more votes but the point is that the United States isn't a democracy it's a republic and I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said when asked what form of government they've given us he said I've given you a republic if you can keep it and I think that that's what's at the root of a lot of this not just the globalism though that's part of it it's that Nancy Pelosi Hillary Clinton and unfortunately a vast number of Americans think they live in a democracy they do not but they're quickly losing their republic and I think Ben Franklin is is shaking his head in his grave over what's happened no no Robert very well said I I couldn't agree more with you and I want to expand on that a little bit if you give me the time but I, I just want to conclude the thought that I was saying that the, that the president uh, Donald Trump will will win uh, in a, uh, uh, the 2020 re-election uh, very likely in a landslide manner. Yeah. And, and those two elections of 1972 and 1984, I was just putting it in perspective in the, in the context of, of the sort of landslide that Donald Trump might win uh, in 2020. But more importantly is the Republican Party taking back the House. Because if the Republican Party doesn't take back the House, the Democrats will continue yes. to do what we have seen the Democrats yes. doing once it took the House back in 2018 election. They have done nothing in terms of legislative agenda for the people of America, you know, whether it is on health care, whether it is on the economy, whether it is on jobs, uh, industry, agriculture. Not a single legislation of any importance has been passed except except the irony that after they had voted on Wednesday for impeaching the president on those two articles, uh, obstruction of justice, uh, obstruction of uh, the Congress and abuse of power, uh, the following day, they voted to pass, finally, uh, the US-Mexico-Canada trade deal that had been sitting on the Democratic uh, house that is on Nancy Pelosi's table for almost a year. So, so they, that was that was a legislation that they passed. Now, but coming back to what you uh, observe, and 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 that's so important uh, that uh, people understand what the Democratic Party has become is no longer the Democratic Party that was it was once was say the party of John F. Kennedy or the party of Harry S. Truman or the party of even Franklin Roosevelt. What the Democratic Party has become, particularly in the period of the Obama administration, uh, but in the last <clears throat> 25 years through the Clinton administration into the Obama administration, is a full-blown, full-blown, unapologetic, progressive party. And now this has to be understood. Progressivism in American politics is nothing but another word, another term for socialism of some variety or even communism. It is a totally now left-wing, left-oriented party that wants to ditch the American Constitution and to make laws and to make legislation and to act as they go along. That means there's no more tradition. The, the, the opposition to electoral college, which is what you pointed out and which is what is their goal, is basically to turn America into a majoritarian country, which is progressivism, is about majoritarianism, which is just another word for dictatorship. Or mob rule. For mob rule, precisely. So they have, they have thrown aside all the fundamental basis of rule of law and constitutional government, as you correctly pointed out, the story of Benjamin Franklin, that's a republic, that is a republic ruled and governed by the constitution and following the, the constitution. So for instance, the bedrock principle in the rule of law, not only in America, but in Western democracies going back all the way, 
and I would say it is in the English speaking world, particularly going all the way back to Magna Carta is an individual is innocent until proven guilty. The presumption of innocence. You are innocent. You can be charged with anything, but the onus, the burden of responsibility is for the prosecutor, for the attorney general, for the uh, director of, uh, of justice in the American system, the DOJ, to go to the courts and then to prove without doubt in the court of law to your jury, to the to your peers as jury, that is the person who is in, indicted, without doubt that you are guilty. So the burden of proof is on the on on on, on the government, on on the prosecutor, and 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 the person you can indict him for whatever you want is innocent until it has been proven. You so know, I, I mentioned that the uh, election coming up in 2020, and if. Donald Trump is re-elected, that would be the jurists, all the Americans who would vote for him would have basically said the House is wrong to vote to impeach, the Senate, you know, um, if they come down uh, unfavorably or whatever, or they, obviously they won't. But um, this whole globalist agenda, it would be a vote against that, wouldn't it? Oh, 100 percent. Again, yeah. to put it in perspective, there's only been three precedents. I mean, if you take the Wednesday vote as a matter that he has been impeached, I mean, and that's a matter sure. of, you know, argument that you raise. But just for less for the argue, uh, for the for this purpose, say that, you know, he was impeached, the matter still to, to go to the Senate to where the trial has to take place. And the Senate will then act as a jury and the chief justice will be the presiding officer. These are all according to the constitutional requirement. President Trump would be the third president to have been impeached. And um, he will be acquitted because there is no 67 votes. It has to be two thirds majority. So there is no 67 votes mm. uh, in, in, in the Senate to uh, find the president guilty and therefore remove him from office. So he will be acquitted. Uh, and, and the House knew that all along. Yes. But, but, but still they went on to impeach him. So let's take the two previous cases. That was Andrew Johnson. Uh, who the vice, was vice president, president under um, uh, President Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, yes, and he was, he was put into office. But let's not try not try not to get into too much detail. In no, this no, thing. too much. <laughs> the point is that he was impeached for whatever reason. I mean, we don't want to get into details. So okay, we won't. He he was impeached by the House, but he was acquitted by the Senate. Yes, and uh, then he went on. He he was from the South. He was from the Tennessee, and that was why he was on the running ticket with. President Lincoln, that the union he chose ticket, him, yeah. yeah, because he was one of the people from the South who did not break from the union, who remained loyal to the union. So he went back to Tennessee and he ran once again for the Senate and he became elected and went back and served in the Senate. Okay, now you have the case of uh, Bill, Clinton. Bill Clinton who was impeached and the matter went to the Senate and he was acquitted. So that happened. The case of Nixon is that he resigned before the vote in the House on impeachment. You know, he was told that, that he will be impeached and that he will lose in the Senate. And so he resigned. So that's that's the thing. Uh, the, 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 the point that you have made is very correct that uh, he the people will completely uh, negate uh, by reelecting the president, President Trump uh, in 2020 what the House has done, what Pelosi has done, and the stain will be on the Democrats, on Nancy Pelosi, yes. that, you know, they rigged up this. It was a totally partisan vote. There was not a single Republican who voted for the articles of impeachment. Only Democrats voted. But the irony is that it was a bipartisan vote, the nay side, had Democrats voting with the Republican. There were two uh, um, Democrats that went across to vote for the Republican, with the Republican. One Democrat voted present, and one Democrat who voted with the Republican have left the Democratic Party and has now joined the Republican Party. So, 
So this, all of this thing has really backfired. But I come back to it, the issue of progressivism is so important. And that's where we are in Canada. Progressivism today, as it was in the, 1920, in the 20th century, very much a socialist agenda that is driven from the top, you know, authoritarian, majoritarian, and basically rubbishing the constitution. So now the globalists, are using again that majoritarian argument, you know, no electoral college, the constitution is something of the past, you know, mm. basically it is the product of all white folks. This is not a rainbow thing. No, no LGBTQ person has signed this, you know, <laughs> blacks were not there because America was <laughs> in, in 1789 when the constitution was passed. Um, a country that was half slave, half free. So here it is, from the progressivist point of view, this is a reactionary, counter-revolutionary document, and it has to be thrown into the garbage can of history. You saw how the Democrats have operated on the question of nomination and vote for the Supreme Court justices, you know. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh had to prove that he's innocent rather than the yeah. Democrats have to prove that he is guilty. And that's exactly what is happening with, with President from that he is he is guilty and he has to prove himself innocent not the other way around the Dem democrats have to have evidence and in the articles of impeachment the two articles of impeachment there is no evidence it's all hearsay you know in fact their 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 main witness the prime witness uh and these are all unelected officials they're bureaucrats they were diplomats they were professors of law. So the, the main witness was uh, Ambassador Sondland, who was the American ambassador to the European Union, and who said in open hearing that it was he who presumed that the conversation that Trump had with President Zelensky of Ukraine was one of quid pro quo. President Trump hadn't asked for a quid pro quo. It is Sondland who presumed that it was quid pro quo, and the whole argument collapsed. <laughs> yes. Uh, listen, Salim, I think we'll have to leave it there. We've covered quite a, a lot of ground, but again, I think you've done an excellent job of putting into the, this impeachment fiasco into context, the broader global sense context. And um, thank you very much. Appreciate your time as always, Salim. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much.